Session 6, this is chapters 14 through 16. Chapter 14. Mistakes. Small mistakes could turn into disasters. Funny little mistakes could snowball so that while you were still smiling at the humor, you would find yourself looking at death. In the city, if he made a mistake, usually there was a way to rectify it, to make it all right. If he fell on his bike and sprained a leg, he could wait for it to heal. If he forgot something in the store, he could find other food in the refrigerator. But now it was different. All so quick and all so incredibly quick. If he sprained a leg, he might starve before he could get around again. If he missed while he was hunting or if the fish moved away, he might starve. If he got sick, really sick, so he couldn't move, he might starve. Mistakes. Early in the new time, he'd learned the most important thing, the truly vital knowledge that drives all creatures in the forest. Food is all. Food was simply everything. All things in the wood, from insects to fish to bears, were always, always looking for food. It was the great single driving influence in nature, to eat. All must eat. But the way he learned it almost killed him. His second new night, his stomach full of fish and the fire smoldering in the shelter, he had been sound asleep when something, he thought later it might be a smell, had awakened him. Near the fire, completely unafraid of the smoking coals, completely unafraid of Brian, a skunk was digging where he buried the eggs. There was some sliver of a moon, and in the faint pearl light, he could see the bushy tail, the white stripes down the back, and he had nearly smiled. He did not know how the skunk had found the eggs. Some smell, perhaps some tiny fragment of the shell, had left a smell, but it almost looked cute. Its little head down and its little tail up as it dug, kicking the sand back. But those were his eggs. Not the skunks, and the half-smile had been quickly replaced with fear that he would lose his food, and he grabbed a handful of sand and he threw it at the skunk. Get out of here! He was going to say more, some silly human words, but in less than half a second, the skunk had, skunk had snapped its rear end up, curved a tail over, and sprayed Brian with a direct shot aimed at his head from less than four feet away. In the tiny confines of the shelter, the effect was devastating. The thick, sulfurous, rotten odor filled the small room, heavy, ugly, and stinking. The corrosive spray that hit his face seared into his lungs and eyes, blinding him. He screamed and threw himself sideways, taking the entire wall off the shelter, and screamed and clawed out of the shelter and ran to the shore of the lake. Stumbling and tripping, he scrambled into the water and slammed his head back and forth, trying to wash his eyes, slashing at the water to clear his eyes. A hundred funny cartoons he had seen about skunks. Cute cartoons about the smell of skunks, cartoons to laugh at and joke about. But when the spray hit, there's nothing funny about it. He was completely blind for almost two hours. A lifetime. He thought that he might be permanently blind, or at least impaired, and that would have been the end. As it was, the pain in his eyes lasted for days and bothered him after that for two weeks. The smell in the shelter and in his clothes and in his hair was still there now, almost a month and a half later. And he had nearly smiled. Mistakes. Food had to be protected. While he was in the lake trying to clear his eyes, the skunk went ahead and dug up all the rest of his turtle legs and ate every one. It licked all the shells clean and couldn't have cared less that Brian was thrashing around in the water like a dying carp. The skunk had found food and was taking it, and Brian was paying for a lesson. Protect food and have a good shelter. Not just a shelter to keep the wind and rain out, but a shelter to protect a shelter to make him safe. The day after the skunk, he set about making a good place to live. The basic idea had been good. The place for his shelter was right, but he just hadn't gone far enough. He'd been lazy, but now he knew the second most important thing about nature, what drives nature. Food was first, but the work for the food went on and on. Nothing in nature was lazy. He tried to take a shortcut and paid for it with his turtle legs which he had come to like more than chicken eggs from the store. They had been fuller somehow and more depth to them. 
He set about improving his shelter by tearing it down. From dead pines up the hill, he brought down heavier logs and fastened several of them across the opening, wedging them at the top and burying the bottoms in the sand. Then he wove long branches in through them to make a truly tight wall. And still not satisfied, he took even thinner branches and wove those into the first weave. When he was at last finished, he could not find a place to put his fists through. It all held together like a very stiff woven basket. He judged the door opening to be the weakest spot, and here he took special time to weave a door of willows in so tight a mesh that no matter how a skunk tried, or a porcupine, he thought, looking at the marks on his leg, could not possibly get through. He had no hinges, but arranged some cut-off limbs at the top on the right way he had a method to hook the door in place, and when he was in and the door was hung, he felt relatively safe. A bear or something big could still get in by tearing in it, but nothing small could bother him, and the weave of the structure still allowed the smoke to filter up through the top and out. All in all, it took him three days to make the shelter, stopping to shoot fish and eat as he went, bathing four times a day to try and get the smell from the skunk to leave. When his house was done and finally done right, he turned to the constant problem, food. It was all right to hunt and eat or fish and eat, but what happened if he had to go a long time without food? What happened when the berries were gone and he got sick or hurt or thinking the skunk laid up temporarily? He needed a way to store food and a place to store it, and he needed food to store. Mistakes. He tried to learn from the mistakes. He couldn't bury food again. He couldn't leave it in the shelter because something like a bear would get at it right away. It had to be high, somehow high and safe. Above the door to the shelter, up the rock face about two feet, was a small ledge that could make a natural storage place, unreachable to animals except that it was unreachable to him as well. A ladder, of course, he needed a ladder, but he had no way to fashion one, nothing to hold the steps on, and that st stopped him until he found a dead pine with many small branches still sticking out. Using his hatchet, he chopped the branches off so they stuck out four or five inches all up along the log, and then he let the log off about 10 feet long and dragged it down to his shelter. It was a little heavy, but dry, and he could manage it. And when he propped it up, he found he could climb to the ledge with ease, though the tree did roll from side to side a bit as he climbed. His food shelf, he thought of it, had been covered with bird manure, and he carefully scraped it clean with sticks. He had never seen birds there, but that was probably because the smoke from the fire went up right across the opening, and they didn't like the smoke. Still he learned, and he took time to weave a snug door for the small opening, with green willows cutting it, so it jammed in tightly, and when he finished, he stood back and looked at the rock face, his shelter below, the food shelf above, and allowed a small bit of pride to come. Not bad, he thought, not bad for somebody who used to have trouble greasing the bearings on his bicycle. Not bad at all. Mistakes. He'd made a good shelter and a food shelf, but he had no food except for fish and the last of the berries. And the fish, as good as they still tasted, were not something he could store. His mother had left some salmon out by mistake one time when they went on an overnight trip to Cape Hesper to visit relatives. And when they got back, the smell filled the whole house. There's no way to store fish. At last, least, he thought, no way to store them dead. But as he looked at the weave of his structure and thought came to him and he moved down to the water. He'd been putting the waste from the fish back in the water and the food had attracted hundreds of new ones. I wonder. They seemed to come easily to the food, at least the small ones. He had no trouble now shooting them and had even speared one with his old fish spear now that he knew to aim low. He could dangle something in his fingers and they might come right up to it. It might be possible, he thought, it might just be possible to trap them, to make some kind of a pond. To his right, at the base of the rock bluff, there were piles of smaller rocks that had fallen from the main chunk, splinters and hunks from double fist size to some as large as his head. He spent an afternoon carrying rocks to the beach and making what amounted to a large pen for holding live fish. 
two rock arms that stuck out 15 feet into the lake and curved together at the end. Where the arms came together, he left an opening about two feet across, and then he sat on the shore and waited. When he had first started dropping the rocks, all the fish had darted away. But his fish, fish trash pile of bones and skin and guts was in the pond area, and the prospect of food brought him back. Soon under an hour, there were 30 or 40 small fish in the enclosure, and Brian made a gate by weaving small willows together into a fine mesh and closed them in. Fresh fish, he yelled. I have fresh fish for sale. Storing live fish to eat later had been a major breakthrough, he thought. It wasn't just keeping him from starving. It was trying to save ahead, to think ahead. Of course, he didn't know how sick he would get a fish. Chapter 15. The days had folded one into another and mixed so that after two or three weeks, he only knew time had passed in days because he made a mark for each day in stone near the door to his shelter. Real time he measured in events. A day was nothing, not a thing to remember. It was just sun coming up, sun going down, and some light in the middle. But events, events were burned into his memory and so he used them to remember time to know and to remember what happened, to keep a mental journal. There had been the day of first meet. That had been a day that started like the rest, but after the sun, clean the camp and make sure there's enough wood for another night. But it was a long time, a long time of eating fish and looking for berries, and he craved more, craved more food, heavier food, deeper food. He craved meat. He thought in the night now of meat and thought of his mother's cooking a roast or dreamed of turkey. And one night he awakened before he had to put wood on the fire with his mouth making saliva and the taste of pork chops in his mouth. It was so real, so real in all a dream, but it left him intent on getting meat. He had been working further and further out for food, sometimes now going nearly a quarter of a mile away from camp for wood. And he saw many small animals. Squirrels were everywhere, small red ones that chattered at him and seemed to swear and jump from limb to limb. There were also many rabbits, large gray ones with a mix of reddish fur, smaller, fast gray ones that he saw only at dawn. The larger ones sometimes sat until he was quite close, then bounded and jerked two or three steps before freezing again. He thought if he worked at it and practiced, he might hit one of the larger rabbits with an arrow or a spear. Never the small ones or the squirrels. They were too small and fast. Then there were the fool birds. They exasperated him to the point where they were close to driving him insane. The birds were everywhere, five and six in a flock, and then the camouflage was so perfect that it was possible for Brian to sit and rest leaning against a tree with one of them standing right in front of him in a willow clump, two feet away, hidden, only to explode into a deafening flight just when Brian least expected it. He just couldn't see them. He couldn't figure out how to locate them before they flew because they stood so perfectly still and blended in so perfectly well. But what made it worse was that they were so dumb or seemed to be dumb that it was almost insulting the way they kept hidden from him. Nor could he get used to the way they exploded up when they flew. It seemed like every time he went for wood, which was every morning, he spent the whole time jumping and jerking in fright as he walked. On one memorable morning, he'd actually reached for a piece of wood, what he thought to be a pitchy stump at the base of a dead birch, his fingers close to touching it, only to have it blow up in his face. But on the day of first meet, he decided the best thing to try for would be a fool bird, and that morning he set out with his bow and spear to get one, to stay with it until he got one and ate some meat. Not to get wood, not to find berries, but to get a bird and get some meat. At first the hunt had not gone well. He saw plenty of birds working up along the shore of the lake to the end, and then down to the other side, but he only saw them after they flew. He had to find a way to see them first, to see them and get close enough to either shoot them with his bow or use his spear, and he could not find a way to see them. When he had gone halfway around the lake and had jumped up 20 or so birds, he finally gave up and sat at the base of a tree. He had to work this out to see what he was doing wrong. There were birds there. He had eyes. He just had to bring the two things together. 
Looking wrong, he thought, I'm looking wrong. More, more than that, I'm being wrong somehow. I'm doing it the wrong way. Fine, sarcasm came into his thoughts. I know that, thank you. I know I'm doing it wrong, but what is right? The morning sun had cooked him until it seemed his brain was frying, sitting by the tree. But nothing came until he got up and started to walk again and hadn't gone two steps when a bird got up. It had been there all the time while he was thinking about how to see them, right next to him, right there. He almost screamed. But this time when the bird flew, something caught his eye and it was the secret key. The bird cut down toward the lake and then seeing it couldn't land in the water, it turned and flew back up the hill into the trees. When it turned, curving through the trees, the sun caught it and Brian for an instant saw it as a shape, sharp pointed in front, back from the head in a streamlined bullet shape to a fat body. Kind of like a pear, he thought, with a point on one end and a fat little body, a flying pear. And that had been the secret. He'd been looking for feathers for the color of the bird, for a bird sitting there. He had to look for the outline instead. He had to see the shape instead of the feathers or colors. He had to train his eyes to see the shape. It was like turning on a television. Suddenly he could see things he never saw before. In just moments, it seemed, he saw three birds before they flew. Saw them sitting and got close to one of them, moving slowly, got close enough to try a shot with his bow. He had missed that time and had missed many more, but he saw them. He saw that little fat shapes with the pointed head sitting in the brush all over the place. Time and time again, he drew, held, and let arrows fly, but he still had no feathers on the arrows, and they were little more than sticks that flopped out of the bow, sometimes going sideways. Even when a bird was seven or eight feet away, the arrow would turn without feathers to stabilize it and hit a brush or a twig. After a time, he gave up with the bow. It had worked all right for the fish when they came right to the end of the arrow, but it wasn't good for any kind of distance, at least not the way it was now. But he carried his fish spear, the original one with the two prongs, and he moved the bow to his left hand and carried the spear in his right. He tried throwing the spear, but he was not good, and not good enough and not fast enough. The birds could fly amazingly fast and get up fast, but in the end, he found that if he saw the bird sitting and moved sideways toward it, not directly toward it, but at an angle back and forth, he could get close enough to put the spear point out ahead, almost to the bird and thrust and lunge with it. He came close twice and then down along the lake, not far from the beaver house, he got his first meat. The bird sat and had lunged and the two points took the bird back down to the ground and killed it almost instantly. It had fluttered a bit and Brian grabbed it and held it in both hands until he was sure it was dead. Then he picked up the spear and the bow and trotted back around the lake to his shelter, where the fire had burned down to glowing coals. He sat looking at the bird, wondering what to do. With the fish, he just cooked them whole, left everything in and picked the meat off. This was different. He would have to clean it. It had always been so simple at home. He would go to the store and get a chicken and it was all cleaned and neat no feathers or insides, and his mother would bake it in the oven, and he would eat it. His mother, from the old time, from the time before, would bake it. Now he had the bird, but he had never cleaned one, never taken the insides out or gotten rid of feathers, and he didn't know where to start. What he wanted, but he wanted the meat. He had to have the meat, and that drove him. In the end, the feathers came off easily. He tried to pluck them out, but the skin was so fragile that it pulled off as well. So he just pulled the skin off the bird, like peeling an orange, she thought, sort of, except when the skin was gone, the insides fell out the back end. It was immediately caught in a cloud of raw odor, a kind of steamy dung odor that came up from the greasy coil of insides that fell from the bird, and he nearly threw up. But there was something else to the smell as well, some kind of a richness that went with his hunger, and that overcame the sick smell. He quickly cut off the neck with his hatchet, cut the feet off the same way, and in his hand he held something like a small chicken with a dark, fat, thick breast and small legs. He set it up on some sticks on the shelter wall and took the feathers and insides down to the water, to his fish pond, 
the fish would eat them or ate what they could, and the feeding action would bring more fish. On second thought, he took out the wing and tail feathers, which were stiff and strong and pretty, and banded and speckled in browns and grays and light reds. There might be a use for them, he thought. Maybe work them into the arrows somehow. The rest he threw in the water and saw the small round fish begin tearing at it and washed his hands. Back at the shelter, the flies were on the meat and he brushed them off. It was amazing how fast they came. But when he built up the fire and the smoke increased, the flies almost magically disappeared. He pushed a pointed stick through the bird and held it over the fire. The fire was too hot. The flames hit the fat and the bird almost ignited. He held it higher, but the heat was worse, and finally he moved it to the side a bit and there it seemed to cook properly, except that it only cooked on one side and all the juice dripped off. He had to rotate it slowly and that was hard to do with his hands. So he found a forked stick and stuck it in the sand to put his cooking stick in. He turned it and in this way he found a proper method to cook the bird. In minutes, the outside was cooked and the odor that came up almost the same as the odor when his mother baked chickens in the oven. And he didn't think he could stand it. But when he tried to pull a piece of the breast meat off, the meat was still raw inside. Patience, he thought. So much of this was patience, waiting and thinking and doing things right. So much of all this, so much of all living was patience and thinking. He settled back, turning the bird slowly, letting the juices go back into the meat, letting it cook and smell and smell and cook. And there came a time when it didn't matter if the meat was done or not. It was black on the outside and hard and hot, and he would eat it. He tore pieces from the breast, a sliver of meat, put it in his mouth and chewed carefully, chewed as slowly and carefully as he could to get all the taste, and he thought. Never, never in all of the food, all the hamburgers and malts, all the fries and meals at home, never in all the candy or pies or cakes, never in all of the roasts or steaks or pizzas, never in all the submarine sandwiches, never, never, never had he tasted anything as fine as that first bite, first meat. Chapter 16. And now he stood at the end of the long part of the lake and was not the same. He would not be the same again. There had been many first days. First arrow day, when he used thread from his tattered old piece of windbreaker and some pitch from a stump to put slivers of feather on a dry willow shaft and make an arrow that would fly correctly. Not accurately, he never got really good at it but fly correctly so that if a rabbit or a fool bird sat in one place long enough, close enough, and he had enough arrows, he could hit it. That brought the first rabbit day, when he killed one of the large rabbits with an arrow and skinned it as he had the first bird. Cooked it the same to find the meat as good, not as rich as the bird, but still good. And there were strips of fat on the back of the rabbit that cooked into the meat to make it richer. Now he went back and forth between rabbits and fool birds when he could, filling in with fish in the middle. Always hungry. I'm always hungry, but I can do it now. I can get food, and I know I can get food, and it makes me more. I know what I can do. He moved closer to the lake to stand of nut brush. There were thick bushes with little sticker, stickler pods that held green nuts, nuts that he thought might be able to eat, but they weren't ripe yet. He was out for a fool bird, and they liked to hide in the base of the thick part of the nut brush, back in where the stems were close together and provided cover. In the second clump, he saw a bird move close to it, paused when, he had the, when the head feathers came up, and it made a sound like a cricket, a sign of alarm just before it flew. Then moved closer when the feathers went down and the bird relaxed. He did this four times, never looking at the bird directly moving toward it at an angle so that it seemed he was moving off to the side. He had perfected this method after many attempts, and it worked so well that he actually caught one with his bare hands until he was standing less than three feet from the bird, which was frozen in a hiding attitude in the brush. The bird held for him, and he put an arrow to the bow, one of the feathered arrows, not a fish arrow, and drew and released. It was a clean miss, and he took another arrow out of the pouch at his belt, 
which he'd made from a piece of his windbreaker sleeve tied at one end to make a bottom. The fool bird sat still for him, and he did not look directly at it until he drew the second arrow and aimed and released and missed again. This time the bird jerked a bit and the arrow stuck next to it so close it almost brushed its breast. Brian only had two more arrows and when he debated moving slowly to change the spear to his right hand and use that to kill the bird, one more shot he decided he'd try it again. He slowly brought another arrow out, put it on the string, aimed and released, and this time he saw a flurry of feathers that meant he'd made a hit. Their bird had been struck off center and was flopping around wildly. Brian jumped on it and grabbed it and slammed it against the ground once sharply to kill it. Then he stood and retrieved his arrows and made sure they were all right and went down to the lake to wash the blood off his hands. He kneeled at the water's edge and put the dead bird and his weapons down and dipped his hands into the water. It was very nearly the last act of his life. Later, he would not know why he started to turn, some smell or sound, a tiny brushing sound, but something caught his ear or nose and he began to turn, and he has had his head half around when he saw a brown wall of fur detach itself from the forest to his rear and come down on him like a runaway truck. He just had time to see that it was a moose. He knew them from pictures, but he did not know and could not guess how large they were when it hit him. It was a cow and she had horns, but she took him in the left side of the back with her forehead, took him and she threw him out into the water and then came after him to finish the job. He had another half second to fill his lungs with air and she was on him again, using her head to drive him down into the bottom of the mud. Insane, he thought, just that, the word insane. Mud filled his eyes, his ears, the horn boss on the moose drove him deeper and deeper into the bottom muck, and suddenly it was over, and he felt alone. He sputtered to the surface, sucking air and fighting panic. And when he wiped the mud and water out of his eyes and cleared them, he saw the cow standing sideways to him, not 10 feet away, calmly chewing on a lily pad root. She didn't appear to even see him or didn't seem to care. And Brian turned carefully and began to swim and crawl, get out of the water. As soon as he moved, the hair on her back went up and she charged him again, using her head and her front hooves this time, slamming him back and down into the water on his back this time. And he screamed the air out of his lungs and hammered on her head with his fists and filled his throat with water. And she left again. Once more, he came to the surface, but he was hurt now, hurt inside, hurt in his ribs. And he stayed hunched over and pretended to be dead. She was standing again, eating. Brian studied her out of one eye, looking to the bank with the other, wondering how seriously he was injured, wondering if she would let him go home this time. Insane. He started to move ever so slowly, her head turned and her back hair went up, like the hair on an angry dog. And he stopped, took a slow breath, the hair went down, and she ate. Move, hair up, stop hair down, move, hair up, a half foot at a time until he was at the edge of the water. He stayed on his hands and knees. Indeed, he was hurt, so he wasn't sure he could walk anyway. And she seemed to accept that, he, that and let him crawl slowly out of the water and up into the trees and brush. When he was behind a tree, he stood carefully and took stock. Legs seemed all right, but his ribs were hurt bad. He could only take short breaths, and then he had a jabbing pain, and his right shoulder seemed to be wrenched somehow. Also, his bow and spear and fool bird were in the water. At least he could walk, and he just about decided to leave everything when the cow moved out to the deeper water and left him as quickly as she'd come, walking down along the shoreline in the shallow water with her long legs making sucking sounds when she pulled them free of the mud. Hanging on a pine limb, he watched her go, half expecting her to turn and come back to run him over again. But she kept going, and when she was well gone from sight, he went to the bank and found the bird and waited out a bit to get his bow and spear. Neither of them were broken, and the arrows, incredibly, were still on his belt in the pouch, although messed up with mud and water. It took him most of an hour to work his way back around the lake. 
His legs worked well enough, but if he took two or three fast steps, he would begin to breathe deeply and the pain from his ribs would stop him and he'd have to lean against a tree until he could slow back down to shallow breathing. She had done more damage than he originally thought, that insane cow. No sense, no sense to it at all, just madness. When he got to the shelter, he crawled inside and was grateful that he had coals were still glowing and that he had thought to get wood first thing in the morning to be ready for the day. Grateful that he had thought to get enough wood for two or three days at a time. Grateful that he had fish nearby if he needed to eat. Grateful, finally, as he dozed off, that he was alive. So insane, he thought, letting sleep cover the pain of his chest. Such an insane attack for no reason, and he fell asleep with his mind trying to make the moose have reason. The noise awakened him. It was a low sound, a low roaring sound that came from the wind. His eyes snapped open, not because it was loud, but because it was new. He felt wind in his shelter and felt the rain that came with wind, and he'd heard thunder many times in the past 47 days. But not this, not this noise. Low, almost alive, almost from a throat some, somehow. The sound, the noise was a roar, a far off roar, but coming at him. And when he was finally awake, he sat up in the darkness, grimacing with pain from the ribs. The pain was different now, a tightened pain, and it seemed less. But the sound, so strange, he thought, a mystery sound, a spirit sound, a bad sound. He took some small wood and got the fire going again, felt some little comfort and cheer from the flames, but he also felt that he should get ready. He did not know how, but he should get ready. The sound was coming for him, just for him, and he had to get ready. The sound wanted him. He found the spear and bow where they were hanging on the pegs of the shelter wall and brought his weapons to the bed he had made of pine boughs. More comfort, but like the comfort of the flames, it didn't work with this new threat that he didn't understand yet. A restless threat, he thought, and stood out of the shelter away from the flames to study the sky, but it was too dark. The sound meant something to him, something from his memory. Something he read about, some, something he had seen on television. Something, oh, he thought, oh no. It was wind, wind like rain, sound of a train with the low belly roar of a train. It was a tornado. That was it, the roar of a train meant bad wind and it was coming for him. God, he thought, on top of the moose, not this, not this. But it was too late, too late to do anything. In the strange stillness, he looked up to the night sky and turned back into a shelter and was leaning over to go through the door opening when it hit. Later, he would think of it and find that it was the same sense, same as the moose, just insanity. He was taken in the back by some mad force and driven into the shelter on his face and slammed down into the pine branches of his bed. At the same time, the wind tore at the fire and sprayed red coals and sparks in a cloud around him. Then it backed out, seemed to hesitate momentarily, and returned with a massive roar, a roar that took his ears and mind and body. He was whipped against the front wall of the shelter like a rag, felt a ripping pain in his ribs again, and then was hammered back down into the sand once more while the wind took the whole wall, his bed, the fire, his tools, all of it, and threw it out into the lake gone out of sight, gone forever. He felt burning on his neck and reached up to find red coals there. He brushed those off and found more in his pants, brushed those away and the wind hit again, heavy gusts, tearing gusts. He heard trees snapping in the forest around the rock, felt his body slipping out and clawed at the rocks to hold himself down. He couldn't think, he just held and knew that he was praying but didn't know what the prayer was. He knew that he wanted to be, to stay and be, and then the wind moved out to the lake. Brian heard the great roaring sucking sounds of the water and opened his eyes to see the lake torn by the wind, the water slamming in great waves that went in all ways, fought each other and then rose in a spout of water going up into the night sky like a wet column of light. It was beautiful and terrible at the same time. The tornado tore more time at the shore tore one more time at the shore on the opposite side of the lake. Brian could hear trees being ripped down, and then it was gone. 
gone as rapidly as it had come. It left nothing, nothing but Brian in the pitch dark. He could find nothing for where the fire had been, not a spark, nothing of his shelter, tools or bed, even the body of the fool bird was gone. I'm back to nothing, he thought, trying to find things in the dark, back to where I was crashed. Hurt in the dark, just the same. As if to empathize, emphasize his thoughts, the mosquitoes, with the fire gone and protective smoke no longer saving him, came back in thick, nostril-clogging swarms. All that was left was the hatchet on his belt. Still there, but now it began to rain, and in the downpour he could never find anything dry enough to get a fire going, and at last he pulled his battered body back in under the overhang where his bed had been and wrapped his arms around his ribs. Sleep didn't come. It couldn't come with the insects ripping at him, so he lay on the rest of the night, slapping mosquitoes and chewing with his mind on that on the day. This morning he had been fat, well, almost fat, and happy, sure of everything, with good weapons and food and the sun in his face and things looking good for the future. And inside of one day, just one day, he'd been run over by a moose and a tornado, had lost everything, and was back to square one just like that. A flip of some giant coin, and he was the loser. But there's a difference now, he thought. There really is a difference. I might be hit, but I'm not done. When the light comes, I'll start to rebuild. I still have the hatchet, and that's all I had in the first place. Come on, he thought, burying his teeth in the darkness. Come on, is that the best you can do? Is that all you can hit me with is a moose and a tornado? Well, he thought, holding his ribs and smiling, then spitting mosquitoes out of his mouth. Well, that won't get the job done. That was the difference now. He had changed, and he was tough. I'm tough where it counts, tough in the head. In the end, right before dawn, a kind of cold snap came down. Something else knew this cold snap. The mosquitoes settled back into the damp grass and under the leaves, and he could sleep, or doze. And the last thought he had that morning as he closed his eyes was, I hope the tornado hit that moose. When he awakened, the sun was cooking the inside of his mouth and had dried his tongue to leather. He had fallen into a deeper sleep with his mouth open just at dawn, and it tasted as if, as if he had been sucking on his foot all night long. He rolled out and almost bellowed with pain from his ribs. They had tightened in the night and seemed to pull at his chest when he moved. He slowed his movements and stood slowly, without stretching unduly, and went to the lake for a drink. At the shore, he kneeled carefully and with great gentleness and drank and rinsed his mouth. To his right, he saw that the fish pond was still there, although the willow gate was gone and there were no fish. They'll come back, he thought, as soon as I can make a spear or bow and get one or two for bait. They'll come back. He turned to look at his shelter and saw that some of the wood from the wall was scattered around the beach, but was still there. And then he saw his bow jammed into a driftwood log, broken, but with the precious string still intact. Not so bad now, not so bad. He looked down the shoreline for other parts of his wall, and that's when he saw it. Out in the lake, in the short part of the L, Something curved and yellow was sticking six or eight inches out of the water. It was a bright color, not an earth or natural color, and for a second he could not place it, and then he knew it for what it was. It's the tail of the plane, he said it aloud, half expecting to hear somebody answer him. There it was, sticking out of the water. The tornado must have flipped the plane around somehow when it hit the lake, changed the position of the plane, and raised the tail. Well, he thought, just look at that. And at the same moment, a cutting thought hit him. He thought of the pilot still in the plane, and that brought a shiver and massive sadness that seemed to settle on him like a weight. And he thought that he should say or do something for the pilot, some words, but he didn't know any of the right words, the religious words. So he went down to the side of the water and he looked at the plane and focused his mind the way he did when he was hunting the fool birds and wanted to concentrate. He focused on the pilot and thought, have rest, have rest forever.